Hey guys, welcome to day one of my STEM project. This is Vera here, and I hope you guys are having a great day. Now, before we take, uh, before we start this lecture, I just wanted to remind you guys that there is another video attached to today's Google Classroom assignment, and I want you guys to check that video out before checking this lecture out because that video is the official start to our three-week uh, Java course, and so I just want to, to take two. Hey guys, welcome to day one of my STEM project. This is Vera here, and I hope you guys are having a great day. Now, before we get started with today's Java lecture, I just wanted to remind you guys that there's another video assigned on today's Google Classroom assignment, and I want you guys to check that video out before tuning into this lecture because that video is the official beginning to our three-week Java, Java program. So please do go and check that video out, and if you have checked that video out, then let's get started with today's lecture. So in today's Java lecture, we're gonna start off pretty light by taking a look at the history of uh, Java, some key features that Java has, and what Java is used to build in the real world. Now the reason we're doing this is because, number one, I wanted to start off with something light for our first day, and also learning about the history of Java, why it is used, and how it is used, will give us a better understanding of all the capabilities that Java has. And it'll also help us visualize all the opportunities and all the possibilities that Java will open up for us as developers after we master the program. So yeah, by the end of this video, my goal is to help you guys visualize some cool projects that you guys can make after you learn Java. So that's the aim of this video. And yeah, let's get started with today's video by taking a look at the history of Java. So Java was created in 1990 by a software hardware company called Sun Microsystems. And Sun Microsystems created and tasked a team of engineers named the Green Team to create a programming language that they could use to build their hardware projects. And this team was actually led by a man named James Gosling, who was a very famous computer scientist at the time. Now the people at Sun Microsystems said that James Gosling and his team had to create a programming language that was fast, efficient, which meant that the language would not use too much memory, and architectural neutral. And what architectural neutral meant was this programming language that James Gosling was going to create, it should be able to run on any platform. So the reason that they specified this was because many programming languages at the time, such as C, were not architectural neutral. So if you wrote your C code on a Windows device, you could only run your program on a Windows device. And if you wrote your C code on a Mac device, you could only run your program on a Mac device. So you can see how this is kind of inconvenient. So Sun Microsystems tasked James Gosling with creating a language that could be run on any device. And so with that, Java was born. Now here's a cool fun fact, I guess. Did you know that James Gosling and his team first named Java Oak because of the oak tree that was outside of James Gosling's office? but they then renamed it to Java because Oak was already trademarked. So that's just a cool fact about Java and you know its naming history because a lot of programming languages have weird stories behind their names. Now, the first public appearance of Java, I guess, or the first commercial launch of Java would come in 1992 in the form of Star 7. So Sun Microsystems in 1992 released a personal digital assistant named Star7, and this, the software for this personal digital assistant was written in Java. Uh, now, the Star7 PDA was a personal digital assistant that used a GUI, or a graphical user interface, and a mascot named Duke to assist the user. So this was kind of like an early iPad, I guess you could say, and the entire software was coded in Java. However, unfortunately, the Star 7 wasn't quite as a success, as much as a success that as the people at Sun Microsystems hoped it would be. And so with this, they figured that maybe electronics and consumer electronics wasn't the best purpose of Java, because Java was far more capable, capable than just uh, consumer electronics. So the people at Sun Microsystems and just the green team in general started to think of different applications that Java could be used for. And in 1995, they found out the perfect application, web development. So at this point, Sun Microsystems started to use Java to build web applications for the newly born internet. And again, the internet was like 
the internet was like a baby during this time, and so there weren't really those many programming languages that could be used to create apps. And therefore, Java, uh, therefore Java had a huge uh, gap to build, I mean, a huge gap to fill, and so they, uh, the people at Sun Microsystems thought, hey, we can be the first player in this new market. And so they introduced Java as a web development technology. So in 1995, the green team released Java 1.0, the first public and open source version of Java. Now it was then in one year later, that the green team also launched a bunch of APIs and a bunch of libraries that would help Java become an ultimate web development uh, programming language. So some APIs that they released were the Java media API, the telephony API and the card API. So these new APIs allowed Java programs to handle different media types, create applications with telephony capabilities, and allow Java to run on a more diverse array of devices. So if you don't know what an API is, it's basically like an extension to a programming language, as in it allows the programming language to do more things. And so the green team, uh, after they released Java to the public, they also released these APIs to give Java a new host of capabilities. And these are just three of many APIs that were released in 1996. Now, the next major update to Java would come in 2007 when JavaFX was released. Now, JavaFX was a new and improved Java graphical user interface library that used the power of XML to create better web interactions with Java. So XML is like an early type of HTML, I guess you could say. And what a graphical user interface means is, you know, all the buttons and all the all the cool stuff that you see when you visit the visit visit a uh, a website. I'm sorry. So you know all the cool buttons and all those stuff that you see when you visit a website. That's called your graphical user interface. So it's basically the front end of your application. And this obviously is very important because we all know how annoying it is to work with the old websites that have like an old graphical interface. So uh, when Java released Java FX, that was a big boost because. Uh, there was a new powerful UI development platform that was launched. Now, another big boost for Java came in 2008 when Android was released. So a new OS named Android was released to the public by Google, and Android used Java as its main programming language to generate UI and build apps. So essentially, if you wanted to build any mobile application for the Android platform, you had to write the code in Java. And because of this, the interest in Java increased a lot because obviously many people wanted to create apps for the Android. And the only way to do that was to learn Java. And then the final kind of big event for Java came in 2009 when a company named Oracle took over Sun Microsystems and hence took over the ownership of the Java programming language. And also another, year, another reason that uh, 2009 was such a big deal for Java was because a popular Java-based software was created, Minecraft. So yeah, Minecraft is actually based on Java and you can actually write Java code to create your own mods in Minecraft, which is pretty cool. And if you guys don't know what Minecraft is, it's basically like a popular video game. So this was a brief history of Java and why it was created and how it has developed over the years. And also another thing to mention is Java is still getting developed a pre modern day and there's new versions of Java that are getting released regularly. So yeah, Oracle still supports Java and they're still developing Java. So yeah, that was the brief history of Java. Now that we know how Java was created and how it had developed over the years, let's take a look at a technical definition of what Java is, right? So what makes Java unique from other programming languages and what are some of Java's key features? Well, this is a technical definition of Java. And don't worry if you un don't understand it at first glance, as we will be going through what I'm what this technical definition means, and we'll be breaking the technical definition down so we can better understand it. So, Java is a high-level, efficient, object-oriented, portable programming language with a large user base. Okay, that was a lot. So, what do I mean by all this technical, uh, technical words? What 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 does this definition mean in the first place, right? So let's try to understand what this definition means and what Java exactly is by dissecting this definition. So as you guys can see, I have highlighted some words that I think uh, we should analyze and we should understand so we can get a better understanding of what Java is. So let's take a look at what high level means. So yeah, 
A high-level programming language is a programming language that makes it easier to give computers instructions by taking care of the more complicated tasks in programming. So what do I mean by that? Well, you see, in programming languages, there are like three sub, uh, there's three sub levels of programming languages. There's three types of programming languages. The first type is a low level programming language. Now, low level programming languages are like zeros and ones. You know how computers, they're what com a computer's native language is binary or zeros and ones. And honestly, the only language that a computer can really understand is binary. So the a computer can only read in zeros and ones, and that's a low-level programming language. Now, obviously, nobody codes in low-level programming languages because they're really hard to code in. For beginners, you're going to have to write all your code in zeros and ones, and to even do something as simple as like printing out somebody's name on the screen or writing somebody's name on the screen, that's going to take like tens, if not even a hundred lines of code, and it's just going to be really cumbersome to write code in binary. So that's one reason that people don't write in binary or people don't write in a low-level programming language. Another reason that low-level programming languages are not popular is because low-level programming languages, you have to take care of everything in a low-level programming language. So you're gonna have to tell your computer, uh, you're gonna have to tell your program where it's gonna store data. You're gonna have to take care of hardware. You're gonna, take, you're gonna have to take care of every aspect of software. So coding in a low-level programming language is just really complicated. And again, that's just because low-level programming languages just consist of zeros and ones. You're directly talking to the computer. Now, the second type of programming language is assembly or like a middle-level programming language. Now, assembly is like, uh, it, uh, assembly is kind of half low-level and half high-level programming languages. And you, re you really don't have to know about assembly languages right now. The important thing to know is a high-level programming language. So what's a high-level programming language? Well, a high-level programming language is basically kind of the opposite of a low-level language. So it, obviously, a low-level language does not use any English. It just uses all zeros and ones to talk to your computer. So it talks in your computer's native language. And although this is easy for your computer to understand, it's really hard for us humans to understand. So the goal of a high-level programming language is to make it easier for humans to understand what they're coding. So high-level programming languages use a lot of English words and a lot of English sentences to make it easier for us to understand what code we're writing. So in a high-level language, you'll find things like if, while, for, and all of those words that you can use when you're writing your code. And another reason that high-level programming languages are so popular is because high-level programming languages allow you to just worry about giving the computer the instructions. So telling the computer what to do. You don't have to worry about hardware. You don't have to worry about the more complicated stuff about software like memory management or like time management. You don't have to worry about those. The program, the high level programming language will take that for you. All you have to do is tell the computer what to do. So high level programming languages are a bit more straightforward and they're a bit more abstract. So they're easier for us humans to understand. However, Computers can't quite directly understand high-level programming languages because you might remember me saying zeros and ones or binary is the only language that computers understand. So how do computers understand the code we're writing? Well, every programming language, every high-level programming language has a translator uh, within itself. So whenever you run your high-level code, that translator is going to translate your high-level code into binary so your computer understands what you're saying. So that's, uh, that's basically what a high-level programming language is. And we'll talk about that translator I was, uh, I was mentioning a bit later on in this video. Now, the second term I want to analyze is efficient. So what is an efficient programming language? Well, Java is considered a very efficient programming language due to the fact that it uses lower memory and runs significantly faster than many other programming languages. So basically, uh, in like, in like the architecture of Java, so in the essence of how Java was made, there was a lot of optimization and there were a lot of cool tricks used to make Java faster and use, uh, to make, allow Java to use less memory. And what this means is Java can even run on devices that are not as powerful. Whereas some program, so let's say you write a program in Python and you write a program in Java. Chances are I can run my Java program uh, on like a lower, and device, a device that doesn't have that much computing power, whereas my Python program would struggle to run because Python just isn't as efficient as Java. So 
that's basically what an efficient programming language is. It just takes, it uses the resources it has to the best ability. Now, object oriented, what is object oriented? Well, here, I'm just gonna give you guys a really vague definition of object oriented for now, because we're gonna be going into that later on in this course. But basically what object oriented is, is it's a type of philosophy. It's type of it's a type of coding philosophy where you write all of uh, where all the code that you write represents some kind of real object in the world or even some kind of imaginary object in the world. It just represents an object. And again, if this is kind of confusing what object oriented means, don't worry. We're going to look at this uh, concept of object oriented programming in a lot more detail. But just remember for now that object oriented programming is just it, it's just a style that you write your code in. So some of you might be familiar with the MLA format or the APA format. Those are different formats that you can write your research papers in. Just like that object oriented programming is just a format that you can write your code in. So yeah, and there's different other formats that you can use too, like functional programming and et cetera. But object oriented is the format that Java supports. Now portable. Now we kind of talked about what a portable programming language is before, but a portable programming language is a programming language that can be executed on any operating system regardless of the operating system they were written on. So again, uh, uh, Java is a portable, portable programming language because it doesn't matter where I wrote my Java code or it doesn't matter where I'm running my Java code. As long as there are no errors in my Java code, it'll run on any machine. So it, that's why it's a portable programming language because you can take it from one machine to another without any problem. Now. Another important thing to talk about is what is a programming language? So Java is a programming language, but uh, what some of you might know is that inside programming languages, there are two subdivisions. Uh, so under programming languages, you have programming languages and scripting languages. So what makes these two subdivisions different? Well, do you remember when I was talking about how programming languages use a translator to convert high level, uh, high level code to binary? Well, it turns out that there are different types of translators that you can use to turn your high level code to binary. And the translator that Java uses and many other programming languages use is called a compiler. And uh, another, so programming languages use compilers to turn code from binary to, uh, from, I'm sorry. So Java, Java and many other programming languages use compilers to convert high level code to binary while scripting languages such as Python use an, in, use an interpreter to convert high-level code to binary. So again, all you have to remember is Java, uh, Java uses a type of translator known as a compiler to convert high-level code to binary. Now, if you are interested in learning the, speci the specific details about how a compiler is different from an interpreter, then I will leave a link down to a cool article uh, in the assignment so you guys can check that out, but that's optional. However, I would recommend that you guys check that out because it's quite an, an interesting article. And then finally, what's a user base? Well, a user base is a term used to refer to all the people that use and code in a certain language. And now I just wanna take a moment to talk about why having a big user base is really important because many people tend to neglect the fact that many of these programming languages have a huge user base and it's important that a programming language has a huge user base. So why is it important that a programming language has a huge user base, you may ask? Well, the reason, there's two main reasons. First of all, if a programming language such as Java has a huge user base, that means you have a lot of libraries to work with. What are libraries, you may ask? Well, libraries are basically files that contain pre-written code that other people have already written. So instead of rewriting, uh, in instead of rewriting code, you can basically use other people's code in your project. So let's say you're making a video game using Java and you need a physics simulator in your video game. So basically a physics simulator is a fancy mathematical program that does some calculations to tell you how your video game objects are supposed to move. So if I throw a ball, my physics simulator would tell me how the ball would move. Now, obviously making a physics uh, simulator from scratch is really hard because there's a lot of math involved in it. However, since Java has such a big user base, there's hundreds if not thousands of people that have already created a physics simulator for you. So all you can do is you can simply take the code that they have written and you can integrate that into your own program, saving you time and effort. And this is what's beautiful about programming and science in general. 
science and programmers, we collaborate with each other to further advance the field as a whole by sharing the work that we have already done. So that's why that's one reason that their uh, big user base is really important. Uh, and you can find libraries in places like uh, you can find libraries for Java in places like GitHub and uh, Maven. So yeah, these are two, and we're gonna get we're gonna dive into more detail about where you can find libraries for Java later on in this course, where we're gonna actually use some libraries to make some cool apps. But for now, just remember that there are plenty of resources where you can find Java libraries or pre-written code. Now. Another reason that having a huge user base is important is because you're going to be uh, given more resources if a programming language has a huge user base. So let's say you're writing your Java code and you run into an error. Now, since Java has a huge user base and there are millions of people coding in Java, it's going to be really easy to resolve your error as all you're going to have to do is you're just going to have to copy the error that you got and paste it into a reputable source or a reputable kind of like an error database such as Stack Overflow or Geeks for Geeks. And then you're gonna, after you put your error into one of these resources, it's gonna give you a step-to-step -step instruction on how you can solve that said error. And you might be wondering, well, how does it give me a step-to-step, -step, uh, how does it give me like a step-to-step -step tutorial on how I can fix that error? Well, it's actually somebody else. It's actually another programmer who has faced the same issue as you and they have decided to post their solution on the internet. Because again, there are millions of people coding in Java, so it's a statistical certainty that there's probably at least one person on the internet that has faced the same problem as you. So you can simply like put in the problem that you have and you're gonna get hundreds if not thousands of resources on how you can fix that problem. So that's why those are the two reasons why it's important that a programming language has a big user base. And also I want you guys to note down these three resources, Stack Overflow, Geeks for Geeks, and GitHub. These three are great programming resources to use whenever you need inspiration, whenever you need to borrow code, or whenever you need to solve an error. And again, we'll be exploring these resources later on in our course. Now that we've taken a look at all of these, let's just end off our video by taking a look at all the things that you can make with Java. So Java is really popular and it's used for many different applications, but five of the most popular applications that Java is used for are web development, robotics, or like IoT, the Internet of Things, mobile app development, specifically for Android, because if you want to make an Android app, you're going to have to use Java. Java is also used for data science and machine learning, or artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, Java is used for that. And also, Java is used for game development. So you can use Java to make your own games, or you can use Java to create mods in your favorite games, such as Minecraft. So yeah, these are the five five important or five of the most widespread uses of Java. And of course, there are a bunch more uses of Java that you can, uh, there is a bunch more applications that Java has, but these are just the five most popular uses of Java. So I hope that you guys kind of get an understanding of how capable Java is and all the powers that Java holds, because honestly, Java or any other programming language for that matter of fact is like magic because you get to control an almighty computer and you can let it uh, you can get it to do anything you want now I'm gonna give you guys a really simple assignment for today uh, so you guys can kind of use the information that you learned from our lecture and the assignment that you guys have today is just write a paragraph so a paragraph is what three to four sentences uh, that talks about uh, of you talking about a project that you want to make after you learn Java so after this three-week course I want you guys to learn a pro uh, I, I want you guys to talk about a project that you want to make using Java. Now this description of the project can be as vague or as detailed as you want. And yeah, get that turned in by tomorrow. I'll be I'll be reading through all the descriptions that you guys submit and I'll I'll send you guys uh, I'll send you guys messages about how how you guys can improve that concept or how you guys can achieve that concept. So make sure you guys uh, turn in that assignment and I'll also post my favorite description on the Google Classroom after I've read all of them. But yeah, that's all for today's video. And also, make sure that you, uh, so I posted a bunch of guides on today's assignment that show you how to download Java for different devices. So make sure you download Java, uh, make sure you download Java using those guides and 
If you have any problems, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to help you. But by tomorrow, it would be, it would be optimal if you guys had Java installed on your machine. Now, that's all for today's video. Again, thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.